in the burial ground of Saqqara in Egypt, 30 kilometers south of Cairo, stands the pyramid complex of the Faro Djoser, built in 2700 BC. Egypt, 5,000 years ago. The Nile Valley, the backbone of a great kingdom, born of the conquest of the north by the south, prospering from this narrow land of fertile land, irrigated by the river. This is the land of the living. In the west, the land of the dead begins. The plateau of the Libyan desert, a huge cemetery overhanging the valley, safe from the seasonal floods of the Nile. That is where all the pharaohs of Egypt lie, in gigantic sepulchres, the pyramids. Over 2,000 years, more than 70 were erected from the north to the south of the valley, all of them on the edge of the desert, west of the river. The model was invented at the start of the third millennium here at Saqqara the necropolis of the city of Memphis, which was then the capital of the kingdom. The pyramid of the Pharaoh Joser, the first that was ever built. Ten times higher than any former sepulcher, it is 60 meters high in six stories that give it its name, the Steppe Pyramid. It was explored for the first time in 1821 by a Prussian general and then by English and German Egyptologists. But in the early 20th century, a spectacular discovery threw everything into question. It had been thought that the pyramid was an isolated monument, but in reality, an aerial photograph showed that it was at the center of an enormous rectangle. The raised ruins of a complex of monuments built for the dead pharaoh, temples and a palace, rose from the sand. The French archaeologist Jean-Philippe Loer devoted the whole of his life to deciphering the layout and rebuilding fragments of it on the base courses and the scattered stones found on the site. Everything to be seen today standing more than a metre above the ground is the result of his reconstruction work. This part of a wall is just a small fragment of a 10 metre high boundary wall that originally enclosed the pyramid. A rectangle, 545 metres long and 277 wide, an area of 15 hectares. At the entrance, Lower discovered the remains of a covered colonnade forming a sort of vestibule that opened onto a large esplanade to the south of the pyramid. The esplanade is empty, unlike a smaller courtyard just beside it, where the ruins of 25 chapels were found. Large galleries inside the enclosure on the west and north sides were probably storerooms to hold supplies of food and clothes for the dead pharaoh's needs. Other traces indicate the existence of two huge chapels and a funerary temple to the north of the pyramid protecting the access to the tomb. Only a few pieces of this gigantic jigsaw puzzle are apparent today but they are enough to reveal an architectural complex that is unique in both its ambition and its invention. The feet of the master of the house set on the plinth of a statue found near to the pyramid. The pharaoh Joser, the founder of the third dynasty. The front of the plinth bears his name as an incarnation of the falcon-headed god Horus. Beside it, is the name of the oldest known architect, Imhotep, Pharaoh's Chancellor, the inventor of the pyramid. There are no documents to tell us what gave him the idea, nor why he chose this shape, but analysis of the construction shows that it was not achieved in one go. In fact, discoveries at the base of the pyramid showed traces of an earlier edifice in the shape of previous royal sepulchres. The construction, only a few meters high, is known as a mastaba. There are many of them in the Saqqara necropolis, 
like this one that was recently restored. The architect started with a simple square mastaba. No doubt considering that to be too modest, he enlarged it once, raising it to three levels, making a four-step pyramid. But that was still not enough. So work began again. The base was enlarged and two more levels were added. That is how this unprecedented tomb was invented, a monumental signal on the same scale as the surroundings. Apart from the pride of its royal sponsor, this was certainly also a new conception of the power of the monarchy. The ancient mastabas were made from mud bricks, fragile and perishable. Imhotep chose dressed stone for his pyramid. According to legend, he was its inventor. In fact, dressed stone had been in use for several centuries, but it was employed sparingly for isolated elements of an edifice. Imhotep was the first to use it on such a large scale as the exclusive material for a funerary monument intended for eternity. Today, the steppe period of Saqqara is the world's most ancient monument in dressed stone. The limestone blocks were hewn from a nearby quarry. They are modestly sized and could be carried by one man alone. To ensure the stability of a structure 60 meters high, unprecedented at that time, the stones were laid in layers sloping at about 16 degrees, like a succession of walls leaning on each other right to the central core. The edifice was raised piece by piece and layer by layer. A huge task because of its size, but one that did not call for any extraordinary equipment. In that sense, the pyramid has no mystery. Its appearance today, rugged, rock-strewn, and rather like a heap of stones, is deceptive. Originally, the pyramid was completely covered by a magnificent smooth facing of white limestone from the quarries at Tora on the other bank of the Nile. Today, little of this facing remains. Dismantled over the centuries, the stones were used in building mosques and palaces in Cairo, leaving these skinned remains here, a flayed pyramid. The Djoser Pyramid was to be the first of a very long series, but during the next dynasty, they had the idea of filling in the steps to make a continuous line, and thus creating the classic smooth-sided pyramid. But that too did not happen all at once. One of the early attempts was at Dashur, 30 kilometers south of Saqqara, the so-called rhomboidal pyramid. At the start, the slope was too steep and had to be rectified in the course of construction. Disappointed with the result, the Faro Snefru had a second one built just beside it. This time, the base was too wide and the pyramid seems to be flattened in spite of being 105 meters high. Unlike the pyramids built later, the Jose Pyramid is nothing more than a gigantic solid tombstone with neither corridors nor vault. The pharaoh's tomb was discovered beneath the pyramid. Dug out, 28 meters below ground level, was an extraordinary network of galleries around a granite vault. These underground funerary spaces are unique in Egyptian history. They are inaccessible today. But Imhotep twinned this network of galleries situated under the pyramid with a second network near to the southern enclosure. It is the pharaoh's second tomb. No one knows the exact reason for this doubling up, but this southern enclosure tomb is at the same depth as the one under the pyramid and reproduces it in both decorations and plan. In both cases, the underground galleries have storehouses stocked with food crockery and clothing that the defunct pharaoh would need during the hereafter. But a pharaoh, even when dead, is nothing without his palace. 
So here Imhotep built a reduced model of the pharaoh's early possessions. At the heart of the complex is a central corridor that opens onto two passages, one on each side. On the wall of the left-hand passage represented facades of the chapels with their arched roofs supported by what was called jed pillars that symbolize the duration and stability of the universe. The symmetrical passage figures the façade of the royal palace. The remains of a splendid covering of blue earthenware tiles imitating reed mats frame the doors of the palace which held the pharaoh himself. These doors are represented as being wide open. That is a meaning of this reproduction of a rolled up mat. The same symbolic opening is shown in the little windows and above the doors. Behind this facade of the palace seen from outside, other rooms were built for the pharaoh to retire into. Still the palace, but seen from inside. On the wall, windows in bas-relief, quite simple. The dead pharaoh is at home here, in his afterlife. A line of cobras, protective divinities of northern Egypt, guards the king's second tomb. On this fragment of wall, in simplified form, is the same decor as the underground palace. Windows, doors, rolled up mats inviting you to enter. But the architectural pretense takes on another dimension for all to see. It is on the scale of a real city, designed as a petrified replica. The great enclosure with its 211 bastions was probably modelled on the real enclosure of the royal city of Memphis, famous for its legendary mud brick walls, whose appearance is carefully reproduced here. Even these little rectangles sculpted in the dressed stone imitate the ends of wooden beams that were put into real brick walls to strengthen their upper parts. The presence in the surround of 14 mock doors, of which only one is a real entrance, is a further indication of faithfulness to the original. The entrance is oddly small and has no system for closing it. The doors are figured further on. At the opening of a long passage crossing the whole thickness of the enclosure are hinges sculpted in the stone along with the outline of the great doors, open for eternity. In the underground palace, Djoser is often depicted running. This shows the ceremony of Hebsed, a ritual in which the living sovereign is running to prove that he has the strength to reign. By continuing to celebrate Hebsed in the afterlife, the dead pharaoh retains his powers for eternity. Below the ground, he can only run in effigy. In the open air, he was provided with a real space for this sacred exercise. The esplanade to the south of the pyramid, where stand the base of two large boundary stones marking the limits of the track, 
and probably symbolizing the limits of the kingdom. After the trial, the ceremony continued in the neighboring courtyard, where the remains of 25 chapels were unearthed. This is the largest architectural complex on the site. The chapels reproduce the typical architecture of the two kingdoms that made up Egypt, on the west of the courtyard, the southern kingdom, on the east, the northern kingdom. Thus, the deceased pharaoh can pay homage to all the gods of the two kingdoms, before being reinstalled in his powers and twice crowned anew. As a sovereign of the north and a sovereign of the south, on a dais served by two flights of steps and supporting a double throne. In front of the chapels, the architect provided access through a kind of shikan, with low walls and open to the sky. With their defensive aspect, they seem to be protecting the approach to the chapels. However, the stone doors folded back and the wide, open, carved wood barriers inviting entrance suggest the opposite. These little walls are in fact a means of materializing the ritual path that leads to the niches holding statues of the pharaoh and stops there. Because there is no way into the chapels, they are solid, without any interior space. Behind the polished stone facades, they are filled with nothing but rocks and gravel. They are make-believe buildings, a full-size stage set, reproducing only the facades of the temporary chapels erected for the ceremony of Hebzed, as it was practiced by the living pharaoh. In the world of the dead, appearances suffice. All the decorative elements here are signs and symbols. These columns with their papyrus form, guarding the suggestion of a door, represent the Nile Delta. But they are also petrified glimpses of the architecture of the living world. An architecture of earth and wood, perishable materials imitated in stone. Such as the ceilings of the entrance corridor and some other rough-hewn interior spaces, the great blocks of stone laid on their sides are sculpted in the round to give the appearance of ceilings made of logs. The facades of the chapels also imitate the traditional forms of vegetal architecture. Their arched roofs copy those of reed-built cabins, curved to give greater resistance. As to the columns that ornament the façade, they are like tree trunks holding up the roof, while the rectangular capitals represent the ends of horizontal beams supported by the uprights, as can still be seen in the Egyptian countryside today. Columns of the same type embellish the facades of the two large chapels to the north and south of the Hebzed courtyard. According to Lower's calculations, they were 12 metres high and large coloured banners were hung from the summits, floating in the breeze to witness the presence of the gods. It's a difficult sight to imagine when looking at what remains today. These columns against the façade symbolise the continuity of the tradition. In the large entrance colonnade, on the other hand, there is a real revolution. The 40 great columns here have no known precedent. This is the first appearance of a style of column that has now become familiar to us, a form that was to mark architecture for millennia to come. The columns are made of piled up drums with the relief carved after assembly. They too are inspired by vegetation. They imitate the stems of reeds or palms tied into bundles, hence the name bundled reed columns.
The drums making up the columns are fitted into the walls, which ensures their stability, at the same time creating niches to house the statues of the dead pharaoh. Their autonomy was still relative, but the move was away from the decorative column, a simple form stuck to the wall, to the structural columns supporting a lintel and ceiling, part of the structure no longer merely flattened decoration, but a volume in space. Did the builder realize what threshold he was crossing? The columns and walls bear traces of paint, black for the walls, red for the columns, a way of hiding the walls that were still needed to make them appear to be completely freestanding. This scrap of stone found here is the oldest architectural sketch ever found. The calculations for a vault. No other document has been found, no text relative to the construction of the pyramid or the surrounding buildings. But the perfect alignment of the walls, the regulation of the brick courses and the attention to detail show that at the beginning of the third millennium, Egypt entered into a period of technical and cultural innovation linked to the development of stone-built architecture. Everything here speaks of unprecedented mastery and of pleasure too, the architect shows his virtuosity by the geometric perfection of his use of dressed stone, here demonstrated by the astonishing curved wall that leads from the courtyard of the Hebsed ceremony towards another temple, one that is quite different from all the other buildings. At the centre of this temple, there is a little room whose ceiling has disappeared. When it was covered, it was lighted by daylight, let in through carved openings in the lintel of the Jed pillars, sculpted in the lintel. An inspiration, an architectural statement, as we might say today, associating sunlight with the symbols of the stability of the kingdom and the world. As with the other buildings, we do not know the exact purpose of the temple. What sets it apart from the others is simply that it has real internal spaces, while the dead pharaoh can be content with blind facades and a sculpted decor, in these rooms that can be entered and walked through, there is something that is more suitable for the living. A ruin, a laboratory. They tried here to transpose the forms inherited from tradition using new materials so as to keep them safe for eternity. And from this desire for imitation came new forms, a new art of building. This revolution took place in a funerary monument. This is certainly not by chance. Let's pretend a representation removed from the practical problems of ordinary mortals gave place to what today we call architecture. At least, that is the way we look at things. For those who built the city in stone, the words imitation, decor, representation, make no sense. No more than the boundary that is so obvious to us between reality and its symbol. For them, the statues of the pharaoh and his family were really and truly the pharaoh and his family. This little stone bunker adjoining the north base of the pyramid is one of the main attractions of the site today. The tourists crowd round to look through these two holes, persuaded that Imhotep put them there so that the living could look inside to see the statue of the pharaoh. Quite the contrary. These holes were not made for us, but for him. On the other side of the stone, night after night, the dead pharaoh looks outwards to where the pole star shines. <laughs>